producer, covering a wide range of subjects, um, host of YouTube channel, Community Issues Group Al Islam Center Seattle. Thank you so much, Naeem, for being with us. And uh, lastly, but definitely not least, we have the director of the film you just watched, Minda Martin. Uh, Minda Martin's filmmaking practice is grounded in feminist praxis and archival historical storytelling. Over the past 25 years, she has been deepening her creative practice, practice, which explores the structures that have shaped the lives of Americans at the margins of who live here. She has written, directed, filmed, edited, and produced eight short films and three feature-length documentary films. She is invested in the possibilities of cultural exchange through media creation and collective remembering through the investigation and appropriation of personal and institutional archives. What drives her, what drives all of her films is the chance to provide stories and experiences that can help viewers make connections between themselves, their communities, their histories, and she currently teaches at University of Washington at Bothell in the Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences Program. Thank you so much, Menda, for this amazing work. And thank you for joining us tonight on the panel. Um, so let, let's make sure that um, the audience can see everyone. For everyone on the panel, uh, I know we have a few questions here in the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Gordon, for making sure I get them. But a lot of people are expressing their love for the film. And there's several questions that we're going to get to from the audience. Thank you guys for uh, sending your questions in. One that I really want to start us off with after I watched the film was this nature of collective power. And I really want to speak to that because it is so invigorating and exciting, particularly in the age that we live in now. We did see the huge demonstration of protests out in the streets after George Floyd's horrendous murder last year in 2020, which I think was very epic too for Seattle. And to hear some of those numbers, I mean, I'm going to start right with you, former council member Larry Gossett, to say that you brought out, you know, a thousand people uh, to, to sit there and give comment to city council. I was excited just last week when we had 276 about the budget amendments. Yeah. So a thousand is very, very awesome. I want you and, and, and other panelists, I want you to be able to speak to that collective people power and how important it is that people be engaged in the civic process. So my question is, when you think about collectivizing people, what are some of the main elements that you have to have with you in order to make people care and to have them get engaged? Well, you have to be, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to you for being willing to moderate uh, this evening's uh, film and program. Uh, but in terms of community organizing, uh, you have to have first relevancy. And when we would go door to door, the first thing we were trying to do is make uh, the issue that we're there to talk to people about relevant to them. They are thinking about building a freeway through your neighborhood. And as you know, and if you don't know, you should know that urban improvement, urban renewal has consistently meant, at least for us Black folk, that we would be the losers, we would be uh, removed, urban renewal, Negro or Black removal. And by making it relevant, then having concrete suggestions about what people could do to make sure that the issue that we're talking about ends up uh, being solved in a way that's more beneficial to us, the people most impacted. Uh, by it. I've been able uh, to use those kind of tactics as a member of the University of Washington Black Student Union, as one of the founders and supporters of the Black Panther Party, uh, as the executive director of the Central Area Motivation Program, where we reduce Black poverty in, in the Central Area over the 15 years I worked there. And then finally, the 25 years I was an elected official in the County Council. Street heat going out and asking the people to get involved in issues that impact their lives like this one related to the freeway is what you have to have in order to, to inspire and get people involved. And then you have to have good organization to make sure that their involvement is meaningful and it leads to political reforms that are 
progressive and helpful to the people. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gossett. That is um, definitely where it's at. I think um, getting people inspired and ignited, particularly in issues that are gonna affect their lives is such a major feat of this. Um, so I, my, my next question really comes to you. And as you think about the work that you're doing with Move Redmond, what are some of the things that this film showcase that are really particular to the work that you're doing out there in Redmond? Yeah, that's a good question. I kind of wanna preface it with um, what's been happening in Redmond. Um, a couple months ago, no. a couple months ago, Move Redmond hosted an event um, to look at accessibility surrounding the light rail station. And we really wanted to see uh, what were people's day-to-day -day experience and conduct a walking audit, um, centering people's experience who live in the neighborhood, work in the neighborhood, um, and also folks that will be taking the light rail soon. And so from that, we shared uh, sort of collective experiences uh, walking the neighborhood um, to really create recommendations around safer streets. While on this walking audit, uh, what we found was uh, a new project. A lot of the, the residents were not aware that there was a new freeway overpass ramp that was being built in their neighborhood right across the street. Um, so it was a free ramp, freeway ramp from the SR520. Um, so the new freeway ramp would relocate exi existing um, eastbound uh, uh, cars onto, onto the south freeway ramp. Um, and so while on this walking audit, folks in the community didn't know this was happening at all. Um, this set off a major red flag uh, for a lot of us, especially because it was something that was proposed a long time ago. And so when I think about this film and sort of thinking about happening, I think one powerful quote that stuck with me was the power of the people is greater um, together. Uh, it's really talking about collective power um, and seeing how uh, folks who are unaware of this project, um, a lot of them together in the same space uh, around having similar experiences can really, um, really, we could really tackle this project. It's not one person working on their own. We're working on it together. Um, so we could really, really confront the issues um, that some of these organizations or some of these uh, large instit institutions have caused. In terms yeah. Great, great points all. Thank you so much for answering that. Uh, next up, uh, Miss Martin Minda, what an amazing project, um, amazing piece of work. I was so, I've watched it a couple of times and, you know, as, as a documentarian myself, I honestly was just like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. We need more films that showcase this kind of story and the narrative of folks up here in Washington, in Seattle, in the Pacific Northwest, and that collectivism. Some of the questions that are coming from uh, the, the crowd here are, uh, how, what was the Seattle Liberation Front is one question. And then I'll follow it up with, people are asking, how can we make this movie available to people in other places? Okay, um, Seattle Liberation Front, um, anyone can respond uh, who'd like to, but um, they were a radical left-wing um, anti-war um, organization, also anti-racist um, and, you know, Larry Gossett and Naeem Sharif probably could say more about that organization because they were around at that time. Um, and uh, yeah, the film is for free and it's going to be in the special collections archives and it's on, you know, it's in public on Vimeo. I can put the link in here. Anybody can watch it and share it and, you know, um, use however you want. Wow. It's available. Does anyone have it? Thanks for making that available. I was already thinking, I'm going to make sure I do a collective uh, visioning of this, but like bring people together to watch it because it's it's really speaks to so much of the work we're doing now because it showcases what can be done with collective power. So thank you again, Minda, for this work. Thank, uh, you. thank you all. Yeah, absolutely. Naeem, I'm going to come to you with the with the next question here because people are asking, was there also opposition to the construction of I-5 and the 99 uh, viaduct? Uh, people are just wondering at that time with that collective power, did you experience opposition to other movements that were kind of, you know, similar to this collective power coming together? Well, that is a good question. Um, well, I want to say this film was just it covered so many bases and it was very well done. 
And you know, to bring that history to this thing, people, I, I don't, most people don't know about it, but it was just, it just got right into the meat and the heart of it. And I think um, this film really needs to be distributed because it really cuts to the heart. But I mean, we're, we're talking about systems that go all the way back to the Oregon Trail where it was built for you know, certain settlers. And then when black folks got on it, they were basically enslaved except for a few ex exceptions. So, and then we talk about um, the international district that was talked about, how that split up the international district, you know, with I-5, the kingdom, all that other stuff. And it, it sliced the international district where you had this freeway and then you had part of the international district. Then on top, they called it the hill. And supposedly they were supposed to put a lid on the freeway, but that didn't happen. So I wonder why that didn't happen. Um, we look at, I don't know if this is answering that question, but we look at other things uh, in the South End where Othello, where all the local income housing was supposed to be developed and so forth. And then there's empty spaces out there. So we get all these promises. And then on, on Yesler Terrace, you know, they, they you know, told the residents there that, okay, we're gonna you know, uh, build new housing and you can come back and you can get some housing, but that was, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Those people have left, you know, and their children have grown up other ways. So we keep getting, getting split up. So I want to take it maybe in a different direction. How do we take this information to the future? After the protests, what did we do after we protest? Just like with George Floyd, we saw this great protest, but then what did we do afterwards? One of the things that I learned in the Black Panther Party is you should have a program, a platform. And number four of the Black Panther Party was that we wanted decent housing fit for shelter for human beings. So you saw how traditionally the, these neighborhoods, they're left to decay, so then they can be bought up cheaply or what have you. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a pattern. And there's something that's called, um, what it is it? Uh, you have these freeways going through uh, black bedrooms so other folks can get to their home. So there's, there's, you know, of course, racism involved, there's classism involved, there's, you know, what your economic status, so forth and so on. So I think the common denominator is that just like these people did in the past, they formed coalitions. Who heard of the Bellevue Garden Club and the Black Panther Party coming together, forming a coalition. So if you can form coalitions with different folks, you know, that, you know, don't have a lot in common, and then those that do have a lot in common, uh, a lot of things can be done. And one of the things I think they mentioned was uh, what power to the public, as we used to say back in the day, power to the people. So I hope that answered that question a little bit. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Sharif. Very, very insightful. Um, next question. I'm going to open this up because um, you guys can let me know who, who you think can answer this best. But um, there's a good question here. How do we prevent some of the protections and rules that evolved from the highway revolt from being weaponized against new housing and infrastructure like the Burke Gilman missing link? It's a great question. Just kind of want to open it up. Um, is, if anybody knows about the Burke Gilman missing link or some of the things that have kind of evolved from kind of revolts around this. You're muted, Mr. Gossett. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't mind uh, responding to the first part of your question because when we were working in a Judkins rejected community and I was glad that um, Mindy and, and Elmer Dixon talked about it, uh, why it was that the Judkins community in 68, 69, 70 started being referred to as the rejected, the uh, Judkins rejected uh, community. Uh, we work on immediate problems and oftentimes we community organizers don't have time or don't take time to thinking about a longer term respect it would have been appropriate to take victories that we uh, successfully uh, 
uh, mounted and got uh, to stop freeway from destroying the community and saying, now we want to go right to improving the housing or creating the housing that's affordable to the class and sector of our population that currently lives there. We didn't we didn't, we don't, we, we didn't think about it then. We don't think about those kinds of things uh, enough. So I wanna give other people an opportunity uh, to respond. I did wanna say something quickly about uh, the Seattle Liberation Front because that was a, the largest revolutionary uh, white radical organization that was ever developed on the campus of the University of Washington. Before it existed, we had SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. They had four or 500 members. But when uh, Seattle Liberation Front organized in 1970, by 71, they had two, three, four thousand 4,000 white radicals fighting against the war, as well as supporting us and meeting with us about anti-racist struggles that were going on in Seattle. So it was a very influential uh entity led by chip marshall and kelly and other progressive minded white men and women thank you oh, thank you thank you so much for that insight uh, we have a lot of questions and i know we have um 23 minutes i'm going to try to rattle through some of these forgive uh, us audience if we don't get to all the questions but one of one of the questions i think it, it's good for you uh, minda it's, it's kind of uh two questions here um it, it, the question says, while this film raises questions about the definitions of progress, it makes me critically look at and think about highways. I am left wondering, what does this mean for our city today? That's number one. And, and just quickly, someone said, have you thought about making a playlist soundtrack available as a fundraiser? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I'll enter the second part, the playlist. Um, these are uh, musicians actually from Central District, from Braxmatics. Does anybody know? that band, Smoke and Honey, um, awesome musicians. And I was very fortunate uh, that they had music to contribute to the film and it, I thought it worked well. Um, their playlist, I'm, I'm sure they would love to play and have their music um, you know, shared. Uh, they're really talented. Uh, the, the, the first question, um, uh, I mean, I think that, um, both Larry and Naeem also could contribute, uh, is that, you know, yeah, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely essential that we organize um, and collectively get together to start thinking about these issues, especially with a cl a climate justice, uh, climate change that is, um, is, is such a crisis. Um, and we, the, the law that was just passed today, the policy, it's like an opportunity that could be devastating um, and breaking up neighborhoods, or it can be something that we could use to, you know, stop and, and climate change. Um, well, I don't think we can stop climate change. I, I meant that we can try to address some of the, um, the issues that are happening with climate change. Um, so uh, did I answer the question or did you need to rephrase that? No, no, that was good okay. because we're talking about what does it mean for our city today? And I think that, you, you know, you, you're kind of hitting the mark there. And, uh, uh, you know, Saul, do you want to address this as well? Because I think that you're talking about the work you're doing out there in Redmond seems very similar to what we need to be thinking about right now. Yeah, I was thinking there's, so there are three aspects I was thinking about it. I was like thinking about it locally and statewide and nationally. Um, just last week, uh, there was a passage of the bipartisan bipartisan infrastructure um, framework. Um, and so there's a new consideration of a new transportation package. Um, and so this is really an opportunity to rethink a lot of these harmful structures that have been passed in the past. And like, instead of, you know, investing in new highway infrastructure, such as uh, the example I used was the SR520 off ramp, right? So investing in these harmful uh, freeway and freeway accessories, instead invest in infrastructure that has better climate mitigation goals or that it's more aligned to what our community actually needs. Um, for me and the folks in my community, it's like walking, biking and public transit are our main access or our main modes of getting around. So instead focusing that at attention and the, that funding into systems that work for folks within our community. 
great point, great point. And I'm trying to uh, go through all these questions. We have a lot of uh, comments. Thank you guys so much for putting questions in there. One is for the organization I work with here. It says, are there King County Equity Now folks working on freeway removal or freeway downsizing now? How about street calming on major dangerous streets like Aurora, Rainier, and Lake City? And what I will say is that um, as uh, Naeem shared with us, that we have to be thinking about how we take a lot of the collective momentum and build a platform for it now. And so in this digital age, it may not be so much as door knocking, but there's digital ad campaigns that really are um, at the heart of it, engaging community members. And through uh, 2020, we were hosting events every two weeks, bringing thousands of people out to just be educated on these issues of inequity and looking at solutions, long range solutions for equity. And so I agree that the same tactics that were displayed in this movie are happening right now where we're talking about different kind of partnerships and organizational connections and, you know, networks that you're building so that people are learning from each other at an organizational level and being able to work on things like this. So when we work with, um, you know, Seattle Greenways, neighborhood Greenways, we're talking to other groups that are like, look, they're looking at helmet laws and how those have been inequitable. They're looking at so many different things. And oftentimes what we have to do is partner with the experts who are on the ground. And I think that that's one of the great things I get to see in my everyday work is that partnership of, you know, how do we look at everything and look at it in an equitable way. And so we start really with a real specific lens and expand out from that lens of, you know, black community and elevating the material conditions of black people and really expand from that standpoint. And so um, thank you so much for that question, but it really is about partnerships. And as people approach, you know, um, King County Equity Now with certain opportunities, I think it's it's on us to say, okay, what can we do right now? How can we expand our capacity to participate in these kind of things? We've been looking at, obviously, these um, evictions that may be looming, right? So we're looking at renters and, you know, their rights. We're trying to connect with different organizations that are really on the ground doing that work. Um, part with again Africatown Community Land Trust on how we're now doing land acquisition right and getting the city to give over certain land so that we can build affordable housing and so that we can build affordable institutions and institutions that are going to be at the root of the solutions that we need in community so that's kind of uh, at the heartbeat of a lot of the work I do um, someone asked in what ways is the expansion of the link public transit system similar and or different from the expansion of highways uh, Naeem if you want to kind of take this because we're seeing this happen right now the link Link Light Rail is expanding to South King County. I personally live in Federal Way, so I'm seeing that expansion happen. Um, is that different than what you guys were fighting for back then with the highways? You're muted. <laughs> well, I think it, it's the same, but it's also different uh, because you knew this was coming. You know, with the other stuff, a lot of it was kept, you know, uh, from the public. But you know about you know the light rail where it's going and what they're doing and and you you know you, you see it whereas a lot of stuff they try to keep undercover to the last minute um, you know the transportation in in our area you know it, it's it's frustrating it, it's you know it's frustrating for you know if you, if you live in a central area if you live elsewhere but, you know let's just be you know real about it it's frustrating. It's frustrating even in the city of Seattle because there's more people living there now. Um, they've changed the traffic. You know, some people like it and some don't, you know? And, you know, this might, it seems like it's geared for, uh, you know, so more well, people to ride uh, public transportation, that's good. But a lot of folks can't do that. You know, uh, take the rainstorm that we had yesterday. You got to catch three or four buses and you're an elderly person. You know, that that's kind of tough. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is you know, if you're younger, okay, it's built for you, you know, to ride a bike. You know, all these so-called villages where you know, everything was in one mile where you can walk and, and, and uh, ride a bike or whatever. So there's many, there's many factors in this whole transportation thing. But I think what um, we've learned, especially from this film in the past, that our voice needs to be heard. 
and you need to bring what you have to these different meetings. You know, like you said, Larry, back in the day, they were able to bring so many people to these meetings and, and voice the concerns. You know, so we need the young people's, uh, they, what they have to put on the plate, you know, with the senior citizens, what we have to put on the plate and, you know, to try to solve this problem because it, it's, it, it's tough, you know, and like I said, there's more people in the city now where before, you know, you could walk around and, and, and do things that was much easier. Now it's, you know, to go five blocks, man, it's a challenge. So we need fresh, young ideas. Uh, anything that you see that we've done in the past, like the Black Panther Party, we say take the good that you see from that, the different, you know, we had a 10 point program. If you see something, do a 2.0, you'll probably do it better than we can. But the thing is to find out what the people want and go from there. And, you know, I look at the, the light rail and I've, you know, I, I look at all those people who was losing their homes, who thought they were safe and everything. And now it's gobbled, you know, it's, it's gobbled up. So um, we just have to organize and get a feel of what, you know, what the people want and pass the baton to the, to the younger folks because they have, they have an idea that might be different than ours. And we just say let's let's just go forward with it. So, it's to me that's a it's a tough question, you know, and and they're hard answers because you cannot please everybody. And uh, the thing is, you just don't want people to get, uh, you know, uh, overrun and and you know, bogarted by the powers to be. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, agree. You know. Yeah. I, I really appreciate. I really appreciate that, Naeem. I think. Uh, what I've been thinking about lately, especially during a time of COVID, is like our organizing, how our organizing has changed. <laughs> um, and still, we still, regardless of the time, have been able to tell stories and continue telling stories and um, uplifting folks in our community. Um, stories have the power to persuade. And I'm a, I'm a public health person. And even in my public health work, I, I use storytelling as my main narrative, right? Because stories have stories are 22 times more likely to be memorable than facts, right? And so they help when you go to police policymakers or they help when you go to folks in the city um, and stand behind some of these changes that are occurring, um, especially when it comes to like infrastructure. Um, and that's why we continue to tell stories, right? Because we could pass them down. We could, we could pass them down, they're memorable. Um, so I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, so I'll agreed. Um, th this question, I'm gonna, I'm kind of gonna open it up, but I think, uh, Mr. Gossett, you may be able to answer this. Uh, there's a question here. My question is to the organizers against these freeways. Later in Seattle's history, the city regrettably rejected the federal forward thrust funds, which have created people-oriented transportation for the region. Is that a delayed result of the success of the anti-freeway movement? Do you know about any of that? Yes. Um... In 1968, 69, I can't remember what year, we voted on Ford Thrust here in the greater Seattle area. And specifically, it was going to create uh, one or one and a half billion dollars to initiate a light rail system in Seattle. And we, some of our representatives like Senator Jackson and them, they had P Congress hold up some money that uh, we could use here in Seattle if the voters in Seattle voted to go forward for thrust and they actually voted against it. The money that had been reserved for Seattle actually went to building light rail in the early 70s, at least began the system of light rail in Washington, DC. The Congress used it for their own uh, neighborhoods and it ended up uh, serving that community and we didn't get uh, we didn't get light rail until 1996 when I was on the King County Council and we were able to push through uh, the Transportation Committee of the County Council, this idea of having light rail in Seattle. And we did it when the council was seven Republicans and six Democrats. And the Republican cat that voted with us ended up, you know, losing his position a couple of years ago because they recruited Rob McKenna to run against him, but I'm really grateful that he voted with the six Democrats and we got light rail started in uh, 96. 
Um, also with light rail, people know that it's going to uh, Tacoma and Everett, Tacoma to the south and Everett to the north. I wish we could tie the idea of creating public lower cost housing all the way along the range. We call it, there's a name for it politically, uh, um, uh, transit oriented development or transit oriented housing, where you talk about the state having to uh, claim some land in order to make sure light rail gets to Tacoma and Everett. But some of that land doesn't get used. Why can't we prioritize that for a lower income housing to be built for the people that either already reside in those communities or are low income are willing to move uh, uh, up near uh, Everett or down near Tacoma if they could find low income housing. But we don't have that intersectionality enough between these issues. We need it more. And I'm hopeful that films like this can help us generate ideas and motivation to tie these issues together. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. And you know, to that front, that's exactly what we're seeing now is these unutilized parcels of land that are owned by Sound Transit that are now being, you know, uh, a, a beam of a like community people saying, we need that land because we can yeah. do something better with it. So we're seeing some of that happen now. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. This this question is for Minda here. It says the archival footage is so powerful to see and hear. How did you think about telling this story through the emotions of the voices in the film versus telling the nuts and bolts facts? And how important is that relationship in advocacy work? Um, I think this echoes to uh, Sol's comment about how stories are more memorable than just facts. Um, and when I was uh, combing through those archives of so many hours of footage, um, it was important for me to get the sort of pulse of the movement that was very diverse um, to try to find women's voices and um, people of color's voices um, and to really get a sense of that variation of those voices. Um, you know, and so that was, was, was essential to me that you could get a sense and a feeling of the city um, rather than just a, a top-down voiceover that just told you what happened. Amazing. Um, there's some really good questions here. I, I'm gonna try to get through them all if we can. Um, this, this question here says, uh, well, someone asked, are there near-term fights we need to be aware of concerning the ongoing pressure to build highways in our state? I think we addressed that a little bit when we were talking about um, how this new federal funding can go either way. And so, and, and I'll just say this in general, one of the things that we are really seeing through this film is happening every single day. When you are uh, there to be able to give public comment, if you could take a break from your job to sign up and get on these city council meetings to let them hear your voice. It is so imperative. We just saw low turnout during the local election, but those are the elections where we need more voters to vote. So there are opportunities, constant opportunities for you to be engaged in the civic process. And it is sometimes on us to figure out where those opportunities lie. But I will say that, you know, there's some budget amendments happening right now in the city of Seattle that really need to, we need to be paying attention to how they're going to wield these ARPA funds, which are uh, oftentimes one-time funding coming from the federal level. These are things where hundreds of millions of dollars are coming into our cities here in Washington state. And Seattle can really serve as a, a, a beacon, a model for other cities to be able to follow with regard to really listening to community collective voice and doing the work that the people are asking them to do. We have to remember that these elected officials are really there because they are representing us and they're supposed to be working for us, um, not against our needs or our desires or our wants. And the things that are needs in community really come at a high level. So I just wanted to kind of address that a bit. We've been talking a little bit here about how we need to be engaged with how this money is going to impact our communities. And I think following the money is a, a, a old term, you know, phrase that many people know when you do that, you're actually staying on top of a lot of things and keeping yourself engaged and informed is really key to that. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Um, someone here says, my wife and I watched from Lafayette, Louisiana. Citizens here have been fighting an urban interstate 49 connector running along the old segregation line. So much of the DOTD tactics here are the same as in the film. 
My question, how can we work to reform state transportation departments? Does it need to start at the top with the Federal Highway Administration? Does it start with Secretary Pete? Uh, I'm going to go to you, uh, Mr. Sharif, because you were talking about this collective um, power and the collective voice. Uh, Saul, you were also addressing it. I think that when we when we bring people together and get them informed, that's kind of some of the answer. But I want I want to hear uh, or let the audience hear from you. Well, I would say that they need to start start in their neighborhood, and from their neighborhood, go to the next neighbor and the next neighborhood. And you know, just like some of the, the uh, strategies we use in the past, if you have to go door to door, go door to door. Or if you can get on, on these social networks, do that. But it's gonna have to come from, from the people there because the people at the top, they don't live in those neighborhoods usually. And you know, they have income sources. They, you know, they might be a, a lobbyist coming to them, patting their po pockets and so forth. So, it has to come from the neighbor, the family, the neighbors, the neighborhood in that city and mobilize as many people as you can and, and have a strategy. Okay, if this freeway is planning to go in my neighborhood, how can I stop it? How can I get enough of my neighbors? You know, just like in the film, you know, they said, well, you can't stop City Hall. And you, you have that negative attitude and, and no one wants to do nothing. Just like you have people say, well, my vote doesn't matter. So I'm not gonna vote and see what happens. You get a big mess. Well, I'm not gonna fill out the census, you know, that happens every 10 years. So you get a big mess in, in redistricting and, and funds going to your neighborhood. So I would say for those people, talk to your neighbors, organize, just like they did there. They had somebody at the house and they had one house, they organized and keep going that and keep building it. And you know, meet every so often and have a plan and a strategy and, and what you want to do. I mean, because if you don't stand up, nothing will happen. If you're waiting for the top to do something for you, well, buddy, you're in bad shape. So you got to do for yourself. Yeah. Trevon, if I could add real quickly. Yes, yes. Uh, I think they should do like uh, uh, Minda show that we did here in Seattle. We didn't, we in the black community did not know between 1966 and the middle of 68, anything about no R.H. Thompson freeway, but it was the people in the uh, University District on 45th and the, particularly the ones in Mount Lake that start getting concerned and they read that it was gonna go through the central area. And they took the initiative, Maynard Arsall and these white folks that live in Mount Lake, they took the initiative to reach out, uh, you know, to me. I was a student at the University of Washington, a leader of the Black Student Union. Some of them had uh, met me. They met, they reached out to the Black Panther Party that Naeem and Elmer were members of. Uh, they reached out to the Black ministers. They reached out to the community councils. That's how they got Ed Banks that was in that movie. So. In Louisiana, somebody, the person that wrote you, got to identify all the community-based organizations on that thoroughfare of where this is going to be built, whether it be Black, white, Latino, or whatever, and not be afraid to reach out and just tell those people this is what's happening. We think you guys should get involved. We have some resources. We're willing to support you. That incentivizes us to get involved. And I know they could do that in Louis, uh, in Louisiana. Yeah. And then by getting the masses across color and geographic lines together, they'll be more powerful dealing with the city government. Yeah, that's it right there. Uh, we, we are out of time, but I have one great question here for Saul. I wanted to make sure we try to get it in. Um, I think it really is connecting to the work that you're doing out there in Redmond. Can you say more about the relationship of highways to air and climate pollution today? And what can we do to make a difference? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, background, environmental health, that's my main thing. Um, but one important thing that we were looking at when we were looking at the over ramp, uh, ramp was uh, looking at the environmental impact statement within these, these large highway projects. Um, 
I think that's a hot tip for folks that are like trying to dismantle these like large projects. Look at the environmental impact statement. Did they do an environmental impact statement? Because that doesn't need to only be done to assess the physical environment and its relation to ecology, but also look at the built environment and its relation to human health. Um, and we see historically how communities of color, especially in proximity to freeways, have taken on the brunt of pollution, uh, looking at both noise and air pollution, um, and in turn have suffered a lot of the adverse health effects. Um, and so with the Health Environment for All Act, which is the HEAL Act, which just passed, um, a lot of projects would be reassessed and reevaluated. Um, and this and the project, such as the project that I'm working on right now with the SR520 over ramp at Overlake, um, they would be questioned. Um, so these projects really need to assess who it's actually harming and how both short term and long term it's going to harm uh, communities. Amazing, amazing. Uh, thank you guys so much for answering these questions. Amazing panel. Thank you to all of the audience members and uh, those out there that are participating that have watched this film with us and it spent the time with us to ask these questions. There are a couple of action items I wanna, wanna um, highlight here in the chat. Front and Center does have a transportation resource page that you can look at and, and connect with. Um, also Move Redmond has a take action on on the uh, WashDOT Overlake Freeway ramp. Um, that is also in the chat. And please endorse the Transportation Bill of Rights, which is also here in the chat in the link. Um, thank you again for everybody for your comments. Um, there's another one here with Front and Center. You can sign on to the letter uh, to legislators about the harms of highways and the need for green equitable transportation investments. That link is also in the chat. Um, please uh, go to all of these amazing links. Um, I think if there's if there's a way, maybe we could try to make them accessible to you all, as Minda has done with this amazing film. Thank you all again for being with us tonight. Thank you, Minda. Thank you, Saul. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Naeem. Appreciate all of you guys uh, for being out here. And um, thank you for knocking on doors. I think no matter what situation or where you fall, if you are making your voice heard, if you are out there in the streets and getting people to have collective power, that's really where it starts. So again, thank you guys so much. And thank you, Minda, for such an inspiring amazing film. Thank you all. Thanks. So moving. Thank you. I'm so honored to be in the part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. And thank you so much, Front and Center and all the organizations that have made this possible for us tonight. So appreciate you guys for bringing us together. I was truly inspired by this film and just reinvigorated my work. So I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great job. Thank you very much.